Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from the CUNY TV Foundation, Capital One Bank, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, New York Community Bank, the Wickoff Group, m and Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, People's United Bank, RBS Citizens Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, Urban American, and These Friends. I realize that everybody likes New York City who is sitting with me and many of my viewers, but I can't believe that every person from around the world wants to own a piece of New York City. It is on fire. It is hot as hell, as one would say. You know, it, it, the world is really going crazy to own real estate in New York City. So today I've assembled this group of very knowledgeable individuals who know, who have the pulse on what's going on in New York City. I have guys who are the leading sales representatives of selling commercial property and one of the most active purchasers. My guests today include Peter Habsburg, who is the chairman and CEO of Eastern Consolidated, Will Silverman, who is a senior managing director at Studley, the senior director of acquisitions for Invesco, Todd Basson, and last but not least, as I proverbially call him, the statistician, because that's his leading expert, the chairman of Massey Knackle Realty, who's celebrating their 25th anniversary tonight, Bob Knackle. So since you're the investor over here and you're buying, and you know, you've said to me prior to the show, you're giving equal opportunity to each one of them you're buying. Tell me, how hard is it to buy? I mean, and you've been a very active investor. It's difficult. <coughs> There's a lot of capital that's chasing, you know, few deals. You have the REITs, the foreign capital, families, uh, the, the investment managers, uh, pension funds. Um, the city uh, is awash with investors that want to invest in New York City. Are we at a bidding war? I mean, when a, a good property goes up there, how many people are, are applying or signing confidentialities or, or agreements to, to, to buy a deal? Michael, there's literally hundreds of people, and we all feel very fortunate that we operate in New York City, is that demand exceeds supply always. There's only one year, Peter and I have been doing this 30 years or more. Um, we've seen only one year in all that time where supply exceeded demand, and that was in 1992 when the RTC was dumping everything in sight. But every, in every other market, even during the Great Recession, demand exceeded supply by a very, very wide margin, and that has helped to exert upward pressure but, on but, values. But it seems that, I mean, Peter, you know, both you and Peter helped me out on an article I recently did, and we were, I, we were trying to compare 2007 to 2013, and you, you, you said it wasn't greater, and I believe that we've seen 2007. You feel that way. 
I thought we'd seen everything <coughs> in 2007. We were never going to see those kind of peaks again or feel this kind of demand. But uh, as we all discussed before, uh, pricing in a lot of categories, certainly land, probably multifamily and retail, are probably double the 2007 levels. And like Bob says, I've, I've never felt this much capital washing over New York City. It's almost like we are the treasury bill of real estate and everyone in the world wants to. I think that's a it. great comment, the treasury bill of real estate, because you know, the treasuries are low yields, and buying a property in New York City is a low yield also. Well, Michael, that, that's why if I could address your issue where I said today's market was not quite as good as 07, clearly I agree with Peter. Look, that, he's apologizing. No, you not, heard this? I'm not apologizing. What I'm saying is that, yes, values now in every property type and every sub-market are higher on a price per square foot basis than they were in 07, particularly land is double where it was in 07. However, if you look at cap rates and compare them to lending rates, the bargain that investors were getting in 2007 was much worse because cap rates were lower than lending rates. Today, there's positive leverage, even though cap rates have compressed. And the average cap rate in the city for all property types today is about 4.56%. You're borrowing well below yeah, that. Oh, yeah, the statistician. No, but, but, you're but, borrowing but Bob, well below that. But the question is, is that are, are interest rates artificially low because of, uh, of the Fed, Fed's policies right now? And as soon as they stop supporting, uh, you know, the buying the the bonds, uh, you know, and we start to see interest rates start to back yeah, you up. Now, here's an interesting thing, and then I want Will's comment. All of us have been in this business for over 30 years. Will's been in for 11 years. The Treasury bill the has gone up. You know, it's been up and down. It's now close to 280 again. It's going to reach that three. That's going to have an effect on the bank's lending, especially on multifamily, because they, they have to protect their credit risk over there and, and their yield. You know, so, and, you know, people are saying that the, the market's going to have a, an adjustment. But, you know, what do you see? I mean, uh, the, the, if treasuries go up, pricing is going to go down? Not necessarily, Michael. So, so two things. Number one, um, with respect to Bob's point, if you look back historically, from 1995 or so to about 2003, the average spread of New York cap rates over treasuries was about 3%. And then, as Bob mentioned, in 04, 05, 06, and 07, it actually inverted. And since then, it's about 2 to 2.5%. Two and, and the 3 to the 2.5 really represents more capital flooding into the sector. But it's still closer to that historic bargain. What could happen that would save us, even if the interest rates were to rise, is if we get some actual job and economic growth and rent start to rise in a manner that's commensurate with that adjustment. Okay. And I, think I, I, th I think there's a question, you know, when we talk about rents, you know, residential rents today are probably at their peak. The residential rents, especially in Manhattan and in certain parts of Brooklyn, are definitely at the highest level mm -hmm. that we've, right. we've seen in, in a lifetime. Office rents are not there. And, you know, somebody, I was with someone today, and we were talking about lower Manhattan, buildings trading at $300, $350 a square foot. I said, that's wonderful. The only thing is that the office rents in lower Manhattan are still $30 a foot. They're well, 30 to 40. 30 to 40 in, in, the, B to, in, the, B in the B to C buildings. Sort of what they were in the last cycle. That's correct. So the, the, there is a question, but there's supply coming on because of the trade center. So, you know, you have that, that, that. That's different space, though. That's class A space. It doesn't really compete with the existing older stock of buildings are that you, are downtown. A, as an investor, you know, you did a lot of residential, and you're rebranding that, the Estrada brand, okay? You've done s some retail condominiums. Mm -hmm. where, where do you think the greatest opportunity, if you could even buy, in 2014 are? It's hard to say. You know, what we've tried to do is look, we, we like to say we like to go where the, where the puck is heading. Um, we want to get out and, and try to take advantage of, of trends in the market. For example, we think... Midtown South uh, is is very tight market and rents have have risen to to peak rents. So in the Midtown South, I think rents are peak. Um, those tenants have no place to go, so they're going to uh, to the Garment Center to what I would call Times Square South, or they're going down to the Financial District. We also think those creative tenants uh, want to be in Brooklyn. So we recently purchased a million feet of industrial space that we're going to do an adaptive reuse to office and accommodate the creative tenants that 
can't find big blocks of space in Midtown South. So I, I think what we're trying to do is try to get ahead of, of different trends that we're seeing and then uh, when we identify them, take advantage of that. I, th I think with respect to downtown, Michael, I think there's two things that are a little bit different with respect to downtown. The first is that I think it's being viewed less monolithically by the investment market, and by that I mean I think that northeastern downtown is starting to be viewed as a different <coughs> market than southeastern downtown. So north of Wall Street, I think you're getting a much stronger response from investors like these buildings that have been selling on William Street. Mm -hmm. I think people are a little bit less excited about the area south of Wall. I think the other issue is that you've got so many professionals who are living in Brooklyn now at stages in their life when it's Since you're the only guy who's living in Brooklyn over here. <laughs> but but I, I me, would live in Brooklyn. But Michael, the me of 15 years ago would already be in the suburbs, and there's a lot of versions of me running around Brooklyn, and that means that downtown is a much more viable commuter option than it might have been a generation ago. And I think that's playing into why people are particularly bullish as they try to chase those Midtown South, Midtown South price refugees. How do you see Queens, Peter, uh, the investment appetite in Queens? It, there's an appetite there, but you correct me if I'm wrong, Bob. I've never, it doesn't have a trading mentality. The families tend to own their properties for a long time, whereas Brooklyn, they trade apartment buildings and properties like playing cards. Yeah, Michael, not to get too many statistics involved, but in Queens, Queens has the lowest turnover of any submarket in the city. It's less than 2% on average. So that means when someone buys a building in Queens, on average, they own it for at least 50 years before they sell. Wow. You know, it sounds Manhattan, Manhattan and Brooklyn-centric with a little bit in Queens because of Long Island City. There are two other boroughs, okay? You know, I don't hear Invesco saying that I want to go to the Bronx. I mean, I'm looking at something in the Bronx right okay. now. So why, why do you like the Bronx? I like the Bronx. I think it has a great retail. There's been a yeah, lot well, we're looking, we're looking at a retail opportunity. We think that the Bronx is uh, it's very dense. It's hard to find sites. And uh, the site that we're looking at has potential someday for a uh, large mixed-use project uh, if you're patient enough to wait out the leases. So I don't think that, I think that there's very little downside. I think that there's midterm upside owning the asset and long term there's a lot of upside. And, and, and then let's talk about Staten Island where they've just rezoned where they're going to put up a, a 62 uh, story wheel and uh, retail. I mean Staten Island has been basically the adopted stepsister. We've never historically done much trading on the island and I think the trading that's been there is probably intra-family. What do you see there, Bob? Yeah, no, well, there's been a lot of activity. We actually sold a lot of notes in Staten Island, new mm -hmm. development. But, sure, they were but, failures. But, Michael, I think the, to Todd's point, and I think Todd is not alone in terms of looking at the outer boroughs, because of the tremendous increase in value that we've seen in Manhattan properties, increasingly investors are looking to the outer boroughs. And this year, you will see a greater number of properties sell in the outer boroughs relative to Manhattan than in any year in the last decade. Now, what about, you know, let's, let's leave because the show airs around the world, but also what about Jersey City? I did a show a couple of weeks ago, and there's a lot of activity going on. Steve, Mayor Steve Furlop is a young, dynamic uh, guy. He's doing a lot of things. They're building yeah, a lot it's of coming residential. into its own. Jersey City, you know, you're talking about rents. Yeah, the, the nicest new buildings are $42 a foot. Mm -hmm. It's not $80 a foot. It's a, it's a thing. Have, have you looked into the uh, those markets? We we do. We we own in uh, we own in Hoboken, which is adjacent to Jersey City, and we've looked at Jersey City. But if I purchased in Jersey City, I'd want to be on the waterfront, because I think if you're off the water, you're buying commodity. How, how do you look at the uh, the hospitality market? You know, we've had a increase of let's say fifteen to eighteen thousand rooms. Uh, you know, we do have fifty five million visitors over here. But, you know, there's really uh, another 11,000 rooms under the market. A lot of the properties, you know, there's no more garages in the city. Of New York no, because they've all been stations. converted. To, they're like gas stations. You know, they become a, uh, a hotel. Have, have you done any uh, interest in hospitality or is that a... Uh, no, we, we don't uh, invest in hotels. Reason? Operating businesses? Uh, you stick to your knitting. So we, we buy retail office and multifamily. We buy industrial, but there's not a lot of industrial in New York City. So The demand for hotel land still remains very significant. Uh, we just put a site under contract at the corner of 40th and 7th. 
uh, for hotel construction that went for over $600 a buildable foot. Wow. Uh, and we see that that demand is continuing. And, and, inc and interestingly, a lot of the demand is from first-time buyers of uh, hotel development Here's sites. Here's the interesting thing. When you buy land for $600 a foot for a hotel, the cost to make that room will probably cost them close to six, $700,000. Mm -hmm. uh, 600000 a key. A key. Right. At that price, you need to have a revenue, a daily revenue, over $500 a night, an average daily rent. That's a high number in the city, and that's why the five-star hotels have a difficulty even surviving because of the volume. And, and Michael, the other things there are sometimes you have sites that have tremendous retail value. Uh, which I think comes into play. But the other mm -hmm. thing is, is I think there's way more hotel rooms than that that have been created in this city because everyone with a spare bedroom in their apartment can go on Airbnb. <laughs> and so there's many thousands more rooms in the inventory that are almost impossible to track. And mm -hmm. occupancy's been running at 85%, which means it's full every day except Sundays. Yeah, and even, even with all the rooms that are being created, if you look at the increase in tourism, which is many, many millions of people since, since 07, um, we realize that tourism is such an important part of our economic drivers here, and that's why it's important that the next administration focus on keeping crime down, because so many of the folks who come here come here because it's perceived to be a safe place to come. They want to shop, spend money. You know, you, you bring up shopping. Retail properties have been selling for the highest prices ever. I mean... And the lowest cap rates. You know, that's right. Soho has just gone off the charts. And Green Street, Mercer Street even, you know. Broadway now is better than West Broadway, uh, which used to be the King Street down there. And Michael, you know what? I think even though some retail is selling at 10000 a foot, 15000 a foot, I think that those properties are undervalued. I think based on the rents that are being received today, um, retail space in the best locations in the city could easily be selling for twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars a foot. You and I think you, you will see you can't look at, you can't look at retail uh, a retail condominium or retail uh, as you'd look at other uh, other real estate. You don't you can't buy that and look at the what you're paying a uh, price per foot. It's not it, to me. It's not an effective met metric. Uh, I think you're, I mean we sold a retail condo on Broadway in Soho. The same piece of real estate with the same leases in place for $41 million in 2010, $57 million in 2012, and $80 million this year. The same piece of real estate with the same leases in place, purely based on where the market thought it would be <coughs> when they roll. And when it went for 80, we had people calling to say that you know, they thought that the market was going to get even stronger going forward. But I think Bob <coughs> makes a fair point, which is there's more global retailers than there are prime spaces that can hold them. And Plus, that the, the, has the one impact on pricing. Retail, street retail in the right locations has seen the best rental growth of any asset class. So, and people are people are buying and paying those numbers, anticipating uh, rental growth. In the 90s, we had the 421Gs, which were tax abatements to convert office buildings to residential. Now you're having some buildings like AIG, some other towers being converted to residential over there. Also, we've had certain retail. At one time, we had ground floor retail, and now we've gone to ground floor, second floor, and third floor retail. Do you see more of these, let's say, older office buildings uh, being converted to both residential and to, uh, to retail? If it's in a, in a retail hub, then I could see the, the conversion. But also, does it work for a retailer? You know, are the ceiling heights right? Are the, are the layouts suitable for the retailers? They need, they need uh, if there's too many columns and low ceilings, it doesn't work. So it really depends on the physical attributes of the asset. Yeah, and Michael, a lot of the older office stock is really functionally obsolete when you look at today's requirements for modern office space. And that's why I think that something the city could do is enact a 421G type program citywide uh, to create an incentive to convert some of these older office buildings, particularly into affordable housing uh, and other. So, so now you've, you, you know, I'm non political, but you've brought up a, a subject over here. You know, the Midtown zoning has been Squad. put on hold. Mm -hmm. We have a new mayor coming into town. How do you see investors looking at the change of administration, you know, as they would say, the, the 20 good years that we've had, you know, under the Giuliani? And the you know uh, the Bloomberg administration, because you are an investor and you and you deal with investors on a daily basis, has 
the election or had an effect on the uh, the feelings of investors, Peter, Bob? Yeah, there's some real trepidation on the part of investors, especially if uh, you own rent-stabilized housing and you hear a statement that uh, the mayor wants may want to freeze rent stabilization increases. That goes right to destroying affordable housing if you do that, just like the rent controls after World War II. Yeah, Michael, I think any time there's a, a change, people naturally are a little concerned the uncertainty that's created by change is something that people are uncomfortable with. Let's bring up that subject about these luxury three, four, five thousand dollar apartment. Who's okay? None of us can afford a. And the most of my the, view, the, the luxury is six thousand to eight thousand dollars a foot today. I mean, that's even right, more yeah. than the three thousand. Okay, the, you know, when somebody says to me they're building a, you, you can buy a condo for twenty two hundred dollars a foot. Somebody says where? I mean, it's <laughs> like I mean, I remember that. You know, what? What are you talking about? Do you see, I mean, there are X number of great sites. Do you see any more of these major developments taking place in well, the city? I think anywhere a developer can get a prime piece of land, they're willing to increase what they're willing to pay for it simply because it appears right now that that market is almost limitless. And I think it's really because of the economic uncertainty that's pervasive around the globe. And so if someone has capital, uh, they're looking at deploying it into New York real estate more so, I think, for asset preservation than for any type of return on that money. I think folks who are investing from other countries look at New York City and say, well, if I invest my $5 million or $10 million or $30 million in New York real estate, when I want to get my money back, I'll probably be able to do it. Uh, and that, I think, is the main driver for all this capital that's coming into the market. There was an article in this week's New York Times which uh, talked about uh, condos in major cities around the globe being $8,500 a foot and more and talking about the $6,000 a foot luxury apartments that are being sold, uh, 157 and uh, CIM and Harry Mack. 132, Macos, right. Uh, at <coughs> 6000 a foot being a bargain, you know, at, you know based on global standard. Well, I think the question is going to be, somebody said, you know, do we have a thousand units going up to chase the same hundred billionaires? <laughs> and at some point, we're going to reach the end of that market, um, but it doesn't seem to be in sight right now. Yeah, the $64,000 question with construction lenders and developers is how deep is that $10 million an apartment market? It's but, only but you sit, but, but you sit you're, 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 you're on the loan committee for M&T Bank. And we ask that question every two weeks. How deep is that market right. because of the price of the units that we're financing? But you're, but you're looking at people who have substantial equity in the deal, and I don't think you've done that many ultra-luxury deals. Quite a few, over 20, with all the names that you'd recognize. But all the deals that are being done have been 35 to 50 percent equity, which is the big difference. Which was the di big difference of 06 and Which 07. is why if we do have a downturn, the <coughs> banks are probably going to be fine. But there, you know, there are more new banks coming into town. Mm -hmm. This year, you know, I've done numerous articles and discussions on this. You know, everybody believes, and in, in the same vein as investors, that the streets of New York are paved with gold, and you should invest as a, as a lender because this is the best market over here. And, I mean, you've gone into the financing business, uh, and you've seen it. Look how much volume you've done this year. Yeah, it's been great. Our financing division has been... Uh has been very, very active, doing a lot of construction loans also. And uh, it's our third year. We'll probably do about $500 million in financing this year. You know, uh, Todd brought out an interesting thing. You bought an industrial site, basically, a great site in Brooklyn over there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you decided not to keep it as re industrial. You're going to do it as mixed-use office? Well, we're going to do it as uh, the plan is to convert it to creative office and perhaps go for a ULERP and try to get uh, the excess FAR on the site uh, rezoned for multifamily. Now, what, what's what's the the group's thoughts about? You know, I, I had done a show on Brooklyn the week before, and we were talking about. Do you believe that Bushwick, Crown Heights, uh, Coney Island, um, and East New York, which I had not heard at all, <laughs> uh, have potential that investors are looking all in those other markets? It's already happening, Michael. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's already it's happening. It's well underway. As we get properties in those neighborhoods, uh, there's a feeding frenzy amongst buyers to get property in areas that they think are going to be the next 
Dumbo or the next Williamsburg. Right. Uh, and so it's almost an insatiable appetite for properties in those areas. How do we uh, keep garages and gas stations left in the city of New York? <laughs> Need city planning to come up with something to exactly. create incentives to keep them. Why, why, are there movie the why are there theaters on Broadway, Michael? Because the city did something proactively to provide incentive for those theaters to remain. And the city can do something as long as they implement some smart policy we can have our parking lots, our parking garages, and the things that are, are needed to provide services, but we just need some smart planning. I agree. Yeah, I, I, I think that the theater example is a great example, and it's also a great reason to make a long-term investment in a parking Yeah, You know what, but I, th I think, you know, you bring up, Bob brings up a very interesting thing. The theaters were maintained because they were transferable air rights mm -hmm. around the theaters, so that can continue to give the theaters the opportunity of having revenue even though they're in a cyclical business that like a daily business over city here. created an okay. economic incentive they, they created an for them economic to stay. incentive so we need economic incentives the same manner because if we have economic like the 421 G's was which was a tax abatement in lower Manhattan which we probably should do again because mm -hmm. there's a need of these old obsolescent buildings you know and if we have city planning in the appropriate way you know, look at the Hudson Yards as a great example of, of use. You know, you take the property, and now who would ever believe, you know, on a former site for the Olympics, we're, we're having, you know, coach and all this property. And look what's happening in the Hudson Yard. 20 years from now, it will be unrecognizable. It will mm -hmm. be a new city within a city. You know, as Steve, uh, Steve Ross did say, and I have to give him credit, he said, look, uh, the Hudson Yards will be the next uh, Rockefeller Center of, you know, within 15 to 20 years. And you know, look, there's not a, we're not building any more land, okay? The, you know, Battery Park City was built because when we built Lower Manhattan, you know, when they built the Trade Center, we're not doing that. So I wish we had more time, but 30 minutes have come up, and i really like to thank Peter, Will, Todd, and Bob, and I'll see you next week.